Good evening. Good evening, Maxime. Good evening, Miriam. Um, good evening to everyone. Oh, hello. This is a great honor for, for me as a director of the Alliance Francaise in Amsterdam to welcome Maxime Rovert. Bonjour, bonsoir. And also Miriam von Reinen. Uh, Ruin Abend. Um, mm -hmm. Ruin Abend. Um, as you might know, Maxime Prover is a um, French philosopher. He dedicated several works and publications to um, Spinoza. Um, he was uh, a fellow at NIAS here in Amsterdam. Uh, he left Amsterdam recently to go to Rome to pursue his research. Um, he talks, he will talk about uh, his new interpretation of Spinoza's ethics tonight, Spinoza Land. Um, so it's a great honor to co-organize this event um, with NIAS um, Balance Edition and uh, the Alliance Francaise uh, Amsterdam. Maxime, action. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Doreen and the Alliance Francaise. Thank you, SPOI25. Thank you, uh, NIAS. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you today and to have the opportunity to discuss the hypothesis or the new reading of Spinoza's philosophy and also Spinoza's milieu with Miriam, who is also a great scholar. And I've been, well, to, to be honest, this is a great opportunity for us to give an example of the collaboration of many people around the project because Miriam's work has been inspiring some of the passages of uh, what I wrote. And I think the whole uh, purpose of this book is to show that even though there are authors to books, there are no owners to ideas. And so I guess this is something we, we should practice today. And uh, we thought it would be more interesting for all of you that we should have a conversation about how we see uh, philosophy or history of philosophy in general, and then Spinoza's case in particular. But maybe I leave Miriam to, um, to you to define uh, how you would like to address these issues. Um, I, I was very uh, happy with, with uh, your book, uh, not only because of uh, what I, I read about uh, uh, Spinoza uh, and, uh, and his, um, his friends, um, but also because because it uh, the way you you uh, uh, wrote about Spinoza, uh, it um, remembered me of the the, the ten years uh, that I had a philosophical cafe in the the city where I I live in Breda in the Netherlands, and the, um, so. Uh, the, the way Spinoza uh, uh, and his his friends, so it's um, it's it likes a, a little bit on the, the the philosophical cafe. So that with with other people who are maybe not philosophers, but you you try to um, to explain and to to be in, in contact with, uh, with other people and uh, with philosophy. So that it's for everybody, it, it can be uh, good to, um, to, to participate in a philosophical uh, debate. And it was in, in Paris that it started with the cafe, the, the philosophical cafe. And um, I, in, in the town where I live, in Breda, I had 10 years also the, the same, the same uh, way to uh, practice philosophy with people who are not philosophers. Thank you, Maya. Maxime? Yeah, it's true um, that when we talk about philosophy, we always consider we're talking about books. As a matter of fact, the, the practice of writing editing, translating books is, and commenting on books is, is obviously uh, uh, central to, to philosophy. But 
It is true that when it comes to conceiving of a philosophy, uh, then oral exchanges play a major role. And so what I wanted to, to track was exactly these moments when people actually gather, exchange ideas, and they are not necessarily uh, confronting these ideas, uh, I would say, um, on, the, on the same level. And so what I, what I wanted to, to make clear is that it's even more interesting when they don't quite talk of the same topics. So you have a doctor uh, who's an anatomist and who's having a conversation with theologians who also take into account the point of view of a mathematician. And this whole gathering of different disciplines that they at that time would consider as one, which is um, natural philosophy, would eventually give to what we call Spinoza as an author, uh, the opportunity to try and organize these ideas that come from different parts of this natural philosophy. And so eventually you realize first uh, that the text might not be like the origin of what a philosophy is, but really interactions that are mainly oral. Of course, we don't have any source to prove uh, what has been said, but we do have uh, actual texts that can let us understand how were these exchanges organized, because some of these authors do actually refer one to the other. So that's one big thing. I think. Uh, uh, Miriam was talking about the, the philosophical cafe and really this practice that was so peculiar like some years ago and people would think oh that's new and that's innovative and um, and that's original actually it was the basic of, of the philosophical life at that time and the second thing I think very interesting that you just pointed out Miriam is the fact that the difference between what is philosophical and what isn't was not totally clear. And quite on the contrary, the reason, one of the reasons why I had to write this book as a novel rather than in an academic form is that if you start uh, studying these very fast exchanges, then it's not possible anymore to draw a line between what is philosophical and what is not, what is private and what is actually relevant to intellectual history. Is a wedding a private event or does it have an impact on a philosophical uh, inquiry? So you have all these questions that will actually come together. And so again, it's not only the distinction about what is philosophical and what is not, but it's also uh, what is private and what is public, and also, um, you know, what is trivial and what is not, and how the everyday life actually permeates uh, the, the philosophy in, in such a way that eventually you, you come to realize that what actually thinks are not individuals. Individuals are just the ultimate agent of a situation that is very complex and where interactions create uh, thinking. So that, that's the main, the main statement of that book. But again, I think um, I had to write it as a novel in order to make it clear that the difference between the concept and perceptions, everyday life and philosophical ideas uh, are blurred actually, it's, it's a permanent interaction. I think that that was one of my main points. And was it, um, yes, uh, I will ask the, the, the question that are uh, rising, uh, but I have a question, Maxime, is, it, uh, is your book as modern as uh, used to be the society in Amsterdam at that time, at the, in the yeah, 17th century. Well, it really is a group portrait. You know, there is something in, in, in the Dutch culture that is partly forgotten by um, scholars around the world that are not maybe accustomed to the, the Netherlands in the 17th century, is that people of that time 
love group portraits. You can see them in the Hermitage Museum in Amsterdam. The, these uh, paintings, they don't travel a lot because they're huge. They have 20, 30 people pausing for eternity because they really want to come together as a group. Um, and I think that's, that's really something I wanted to reproduce, like to take into account the fact that these people, they really thought of themselves as a group um, not necessarily around a single project that would be very defined, such as Jonathan Israel would, would uh, put it, for example. So it's not necessarily the radical enlightenment sought out as, you know, a front of ideas defending a democratic, uh, egalitarian view of politics and also of metaphysics and so on, but it's rather a group of people who might differ in the detail, but who really want to stand together. And so the, the, this group portrait, uh, again, was meant to, to respect something that is so profoundly Dutch, uh, at least from, from the, the Netherlands of the 17th century, taking into account the fact that Spinoza himself identifies more with the city of Amsterdam than with any other form of community. So he was born in a Jewish community, but he never ever refers explicitly uh, to, uh, to, to this uh, biography of his, uh, nor do his friends. Actually, it's only uh, his adversaries that will keep coming back to this origin, but himself, He's from Amsterdam and he's typically from Amsterdam in the sense that in the 17th century, Amsterdam itself is, is this very diverse society where uh, people can live more or less peacefully because it's, it's of course lots of struggles and strifes and um, so it's not necessarily peaceful in the sense of nothing happening, but it's rather peaceful as a diverse um, uh, yeah, society where the, I would say, uh, debate is welcome, not by everybody. So of course, on the margins, you will have the extremists that will try to make this debate uh, stop. But in, in between, and really I'm, I'm, I'm saying it not necessarily in these institutions, but rather in the members of, of society, those who can follow or not, uh, what the, the officials say, there is, there is something that is really plastic in the interactions between them. So we know, for example, that uh, people that are object of cherem, so that's the, that's the banishment from the Jewish community, many times continue to see their friends from the Jewish community in spite of the prohibition. So the, the, the rabbis, they really get mad uh, with, the, with their community because they would like their orders to be followed and people just don't care. And you find in Spinoza philosophy, some of the um, traces of these behaviors. So people in Amsterdam don't really obey to anyone. And Spinoza has a very beautiful theory that the Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew would obey to many laws because they were accustomed to obeying. They, they were ex ancient slaves, so uh, they wouldn't have any problems to obey. And this gives, by contrast, a good idea of what were, uh, how people in Amsterdam were behaving, whether Jew or not, they would just not be accustomed to obeying, so they would just don't care. And so the, when, you, when it comes to liberty or freedom of thinking, we always see it as a small group of people trying to impose on a society that could be reluctant um, a new value that would be uh, freedom of speech or freedom of belief and so on. But what happens is that it's really almost the, the other way around. That is, you have a society where many things happen more or less randomly, and you have institutions that try to impose norms um, and like for the reformed church, they really want to take over the state and eventually they will succeed. Um, but really you have 20 years known as the, the years of the, the free liberty. Um, 
when you really have these all these intellectual interactions going on at the same time. And I think that's something um, Miriam and I have been studying for quite a time now. And really, uh, Spinoza Land is sort of a synthesis of this uh, research that has been going on now uh, for decades um, on Amsterdam and on the Netherlands in the 17th century. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, if I may add, uh, before if maybe you wanted to say something, Miriam, um, uh, I would like to say to the participants that if they want, if you want to ask any questions, you can uh, write your questions in the Q&A and, and I will select uh, questions that I will ask at the end of the debate. So don't, please don't hesitate to ask your questions. Sorry, Miriam. Yeah. Um. Now, I just have a, a little question because I had uh, the, the French uh, book and the, the Dutch and um, the, the, the French book uh, is called the Le Plan Spinoza and the Netherlands, the translation is Spinoza Land. So the, the country of Spinoza, country Spinoza, Spinoza's country. Um, and um, that, that's a difference. A clan is, is a, a group, and um, not only ju just a group, but a very uh, strong uh, um, so a group of, of friends or a group of uh, it's uh, it's not um, so it seemed to be something very special what they have together. So it's not easy in the clan to to be part of it if you are not uh, a person who uh, uh, it's it's not your how you say that it's it's not quartier uh, it's not. Uh, uh, it's not so much. It's not uh, a clan. Mm. Clan is something very, very strong. They have a strong it's contact. So it's not uh, a group which, which is not so important for the people. The clan and uh, Spinoza land. It's the whole country. It's yeah, yeah, Maxim. To what extent is the, is the group perspective to philosophy prevalent in in today's academia, for example? Well, first, so so um, you have to know that the clan uh, has never only in Turkey uh, is the book translated as the Le Clan Spinoza. Most of the editors that have been translating that book have changed the name. In Italy, it's called Tutte le Vite di Spinoza for two reasons. First, Italians don't really like to play with the image of a clan because of obvious connection with the mafia. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And the second point is there is a huge tradition in Italy for vite, for, for, to, for biographies since Alberti and, and all his successors. So I think each country has a specific way to refer to this group portrait. And I, I, now that I talk about it, it would have been fun to, to entitle the book, A Group Portrait of Spinoza uh, in the Netherlands, because that would have been a, a, an explicit reference uh, to uh, the, this art I was talking about. The thing is, I think Spinoza land is, uh, means that there was another Netherlands that exactly as you said, was very small. It was shared by a few, uh, a few people in the Netherlands, but it was an alternative country that was dreamt of in the 17th century, exactly at the time that is now associated with, you know, the growth of Holland as a, a commercial state and 
Of course, as a monarchy, because after 72, um, uh, the, the, the Orange family takes over. And so I think Spinoza land was this alternative country that uh, Netherlands never became. So it, it's, it's something, it's a possible, something that these, these uh, who could have been the great fathers of uh, Netherlands today, tried to build and actually didn't succeed. It's, it's, it's a sort of uh, historical utopia uh, that never became the Netherlands, but they really wanted to do something. And to me, what is really touching in Amsterdam is when you go to, uh, to the palace, to the, to the Dam Palace, you really see the greatest monument of this dream because you can see in all, uh, all the... Um, uh, the images and the carvings and the sculptures you can see, uh, it tells the story of this republic that was meant to be a republic, of course, built on, on commerce, but also very free in terms, of, um, uh, in terms of religion, in terms of politics. And so the idea is that this little clan, this small clan, that in, in fact, uh, in the beginning is not only uh, defined by uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the small extent of the group, but also by the fact that some of them are related through marriage. So it is literally a clan in terms of anthropology. It's, it's, it's amazing to see that these people that are intellectual actually belong to the same families and sometimes marry uh, the second uh, cousin of their friend. And so this is a um, uh, um, historical inquiry that Frank Mertens has been doing for some years now. And it's always very impressive to, to realize that it's really, as Miriam was saying, it's really a small group and sometimes some, just a couple of families that are responsible for this marvelous pre-enlightenment. Uh, so that's one thing that seemed to me very important to emphasize. And so, of course, Spinoza land doesn't mean that this was all Netherlands. It's quite the contrary. It's the Netherlands that never, never really uh, evolved into a country, I would say. And going back to Doreen's uh, question, I would say today, uh, his intellectual history is changing, partly because uh, I guess we have a, a, a sensibility, a specific sensibility towards networks. We are uh, the generation that is accustomed to um, having huge networks and we know uh, networks do make a difference. So we have a specific uh, attention to networks as opposed to authors, single individuals that would produce um, uh, single works. So today after uh, Dieter Heinrich, who is a, a great uh, historian who studied um, German idealists, um, we have this concept of constellation. So the idea of constellation is that, you know, drawing off the images of the stars and if you want to describe a constellation, you have to take into account several stars and it's only in their relationship that you can really see the pattern you're looking for. Um, so Dieter Heinrich invented this concept, but still in my, in my opinion, um, a constellation is too fixed to uh, describe what I really wanted to show is that these uh, roles actually change through time. And so you really can't place the authors because they really change and it depends so much on their, on their affects and on their social lives and also on their institutional positions that really you can't define them as units that would be fixed. So of course you, you now look at something that is closer to actor network theories which are theories that are more familiar to sociologists who study them because they have many kinds of, of, um, of data, as I would say, to study um, uh, major things. Some of these data uh, for us are missing because 
of course, you can sort of try, try to track um, sociologically how uh, the philosophy of Spinoza was born in Emilio, for example. But what I thought more relevant is that if I gather all the data I have, the most interesting way to try and study it is to invent a new form of, of uh, telling. You know, Umberto Eco has a fabulous phrase that is, if it's too complicated to explain, just tell it, tell the story. And so uh, I followed this path. I, I thought it's, it is so complex to study the influence of an anatomist on a mathematician and the influence on a mathematician, on a theologian and so on. It's very difficult also to demonstrate because you can't really prove that one had a major impact on the other. You can just compare them and make your reader feel that yes, there is something in, in common, but you can't explicit, explicitly say what it is and you can't demonstrate uh, what exactly is the link. So I, uh, my, my bet was to play with the intelligence of my reader. So instead of, of making a statement and instead of saying, here is what happened and I can prove it, well, I chose to tell a story in order for the readers to, 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 to feel, sort of to, to, to guess what exactly is the relation, uh, how, how you pass from, say, uh, theological perspective to uh, a metaphysical statement. How do you go from one to the other? This is something I, I feel I can sort of develop in an article in an academic circle. But in that book, I really wanted the, the readers to do the work. So to make sure that they would make the last step towards uh, a proper hypothesis about these interactions. So it's really something very complex that takes into account a theory that would be something like the actor network theory, but also the, the, the idea that if I want to make it understood uh, to a general public, but also to scholars, I really need to tell more than explain. And then maybe, because if I had explained or tried to explain everything, the book would be like 2000 pages long. It would be much longer and much more complex and maybe even less convincing because again, it's not something that you can properly demonstrate. It's something you, had, you have to leave some kind of freedom to these movements so that people can actually perceive them. If you try to stop them, if you try to photograph them, then you give a fixed image of them and it's, it's less convincing because they are not fixed. So it's, they are so moving, like for example, between Spinoza and Steno, which is my favorite case because Steno is a very fluid um, author. So he starts as, a, as, a, um, as an anatomist, he's considered a Cartesian, but actually if you, if you read very carefully his text, He's not really a Cartesian. He's like he, his work is generally in a frame that was defined by Descartes' philosophy. But every time he demonstrates something, it's against Descartes. So he's obviously he has a very subtle position from the start. And when he becomes a Christ, um, a Catholic, so he goes to Italy and he converts himself to Catholicism, and. Again, his positions are very subtle. So he continues to defend a certain vision of, of truth or what he calls truth that changes because it's now more theological, but still he's very subtle at times where he would, he would question a vision of um, rational truth that might be a bit too naive. Like for example, the Cartesian, they really believe that truth becomes available or accessible from Descartes and on. So uh, it's very interesting. It's the definition of modernity. These guys, they really consider that truth is to come. So it's, it's uh, science is in progress, which is a major shift when you, you consider uh, 
Renaissance uh, vision of the truth that has been lost or that has to be found back. But the truth was, suppo was supposed to be uh, in the past and in the modern times, what defines modernity is that truth is to be found in the future. It, it doesn't start with Descartes, but Bacon and other authors are, are the authors that would make this movement really uh, perceivable. You really can observe it at these times. So Steno is, about, is, is skeptical about this movement. And it's very interesting to have these sort of dissonances where you can track that these authors, they are friends, but they still don't quite agree. And at some point they, they can agree and remain friends. And for some reason, this balance can be broken so that they become enemies. And so again, when it comes back to constellations, I think the movement is more interesting than trying to have a fixed image of these relationships. And the more it's moving, the more you can understand how actually these interactions think. That is to say, they produce new ideas more than would individuals. Um, Maxim, if I may ask uh, one question from participants. Uh, when writing fiction, the author's methods might be different from writing philosophy. Did writing fiction about Spinoza required identification or empathy? Um, did you therefore learn new things about Spinoza through writing this uh, novel? That's a very good question because what I felt is that uh, actually identification is very common also in academic writing. You can feel like a, a specialist of Spinoza easily tend to defend him against objections, for example, and try to, to give uh, a good image of him, for example, against uh, Jewish theologians, for example. And the more I could feel that, the more I thought, okay, so maybe it's not the idea, the good idea to try and be neutral because even in most academic, most uh, scientific uh, papers and books, people are not neutral. So I, I tried to do the opposite. That is to do exactly what, what uh, uh, the participants is suggesting, that is, to get involved in such an obvious way that the reader himself or herself would have the, the reaction of weight, of you know, trying to get more, uh, more neutral. Instead of having people following me in my enthusiasm, for example, I would make it so clear that the reaction of the reader would be the opposite, like, uh, okay, like, you're very enthusiastic about uh, Rabbi Mortira or maybe about Stino as I just was or about whoever. And you can feel there are so many affects involved in fiction writing that yourself, you try to see through the affects. You can use them to get a better idea of what's going on, but you can also sort of withdraw when it comes to uh, to have an, an idea, for example, of the, of the real relationship between two people. So if, if there are, there's much love or friendship involved on the one side and uh, much rejection on the other side, then you as a reader have a, a different point of view that takes into account the diversity of emotions. And really, uh, the idea of the faction is that I take uh, sources that are absolutely, uh, well, they, they, they are uh, the fundamentals of history, you know, so there are something to be interpreted, but they are also the basis of our, of our work. And what I did is that I just injected life into these sources. So mm -hmm. instead of commenting on the source, I just try to make the event be live again. And to make it live again, of course, I need to use my own body. And that includes uh, so my, my own impressions. But also, there is, that's something very important. 
not necessarily inject my own feelings from a man from the 21st century. And again, I will, I will take an example from Steno. Uh, Steno sees, uh, probably tried to uh, convert Spinoza uh, to Catholicism because we have, a, we have a letter that is extend and that, that shows this. And in, um, in a declaration to, um, uh, to the Vatican, Spino, uh, Steno says explicitly that he felt great compassion towards Spinoza. And we know that a man in the 17th century that feels great compassion will express this by crying. So there is no taboo in the 17th century for a man, an adult male, uh, to cry. It's, it's really normal. And we also know that compassion is something that makes people cry. That's how you express compassion. So for that reason, it was natural for me, natural in the sense that I think it's historically relevant to portray Steno as leaving Spinoza crying out for not being capable of saving his friend for, for whatever hell um, he believes uh, Spinoza is condemned to. So this is a good example of something that, uh, that is a vitalization of a source, but it doesn't quite come from me because I wouldn't cry uh, if I couldn't convert anybody to Spinoza's philosophy, for example, because I wouldn't feel these effects. I, the, my emotions are not framed that, like this. So really the difficulty of, of uh, writing a novel that would be based on sources is mainly to make sure that the affects I give to the characters are, do, do not come from uh, the 21st century, but are relevant in the 17th century. That was one of the great challenges of that book. So you directly answer one of my questions of the risk. Uh, indeed, to, to write um, a faction, a philosophical faction uh, in the beautiful as well. Um, maybe, yeah. maybe I can just say a word about yeah. the risk, because it's, the, it's uh, consubstantial to, to the project, is the risk is to make mistakes. And I think one of the main statements of this book is historians need to make mistakes. We need to write things that are wrong, so that we continue to, to, to correct uh, each other. And that's actually what happened with this very translation into Dutch, is that Frank Mertens has contributed to the translation and also he corrected an awful lot of mistakes I had made. And certainly that even in this translation that is also corrected, there might be other mistakes that will be corrected in the future. So really, when you go into this detail, you will probably either miss some, some important information or really reproduce mistakes that you find in other books and maybe sometimes even produce new, new errors. And really that's one of the things I'm really the most uh, militant about is that uh, instead of trying to refrain from hypothesis and uh, you know, cowardly go back to what we are sure of, which is something that has impoverished so much uh, Spinoza's bi biography, we need to, uh, well, maybe not be too bold as to just, you know, say, say things that would be without source, but we need, to, we need to try and propose new visions so that we do have something we can talk about and really make mistakes and say things that will be proven wrong to me is very important. So it's, it's really, it's important that in this book, there are many mistakes and many things that will be corrected in the near future. And could you elaborate on the importance of the biography of a philosopher for understanding the work? Well, to me, honestly, I think biography as a genre is, is uh, really, um, it's overvalued today. Like the, the very idea of telling the story of one single individual seems absurd to me. And actually, um, that's the reason for this whole book. I mean, some, someone, an, another editor 
had asked me to write a, a Spinoza biography. And that, that's actually why I, I started this whole project because I said, oh, okay, well, I will, I will tell the story of Spinoza's life. And as I started working, I realized, wait, this doesn't even make sense. Uh, we don't live our lives as single individuals. This is not what life is about, you know? And so it's, it's just impossible. It's pure nonsense. Uh, these biopics, there's so many movies we see that really, you know, so the idea is that uh, the character would have met a problem in his child or his or her childhood and then, so there is the problem maybe uh, with the parents or in the family that it, he will bring into his adulthood. And then maybe through philosophy or mathematics or politics or whatever it is, he or she will succeed to have some form of, you know, uh, yeah, success and overcome the initial problem. This is, this is just a technique of writing uh, a scenario. It's nothing, it's nothing else. It's just a stupid technique to write a story, but this, is, this has nothing to do with life. And so I really wanted to go back to what life is as first, a disorganized uh, series of events, like they, they come up and you know, there's uh, in particular death of characters uh, really bothered me because my characters, they die out of the blue, you know, I have no reason to make uh, Mortira die uh, in, in, the, in the late uh, 50s. It's really bothering. There is no reason for that. But this is life. That, that, that's how life goes. You know, people die uh, when they are not supposed to. And, um, and I really, or maybe the, the country is invaded, what, what happened to, to the Netherlands in, in 1672. And so, well, it's, it has no reason to happen if you look at intellectual history. I mean, uh, you know, they are all working on very bold projects and they're they really, they are thinking of what could be um, um, a very free uh, state. And in the meantime, France invades uh, the country and it's not, it, 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 it's not at all possible anymore. And then Spinoza has to write the, the political treatise, which is a totally different point of view, which is whatever, uh, whatever form has the state, how to improve it, how to make it work. So the question has changed drastically because of something that has nothing philosophical to do about it, you know? It's just that the country was invaded. So I really wanted to go back to this disorder. And that's, that's, what, that's the whole project. It's to study something that is, it's not totally random, but it's chaotic, that's different. And so since it's chaotic, you have causes that have effects that have nothing to do with the cause. That's the definition of chaotic. Mm -hmm. And today we have tools for that. Spinoza and his friends didn't have. They really, they thought of causality of something linear. And today we can, we can study something that is very different, that is more complex. And that's the idea of that book. Miriam, what do you think of uh, Maxim's work method? Oh, no. uh, what, what do you think of uh, yeah this this, this meth new method of uh, thinking and writing? Or did you yeah did you wanted to add anything regarding um, what he said regard um, about um, the bi biography how he interpret the yeah philosophers biographies? Yes, that it's not important. No, it's um, uh, too uh, esteem too much. Uh, he said the, bio the biography the idea of biography it's um, it's over. Um, uh, estimated. Mm. Yeah, that's what he says. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> that it's. Um, uh, do you mean that it's it's um, it's not important uh, for the in the in the life of a person? It's not important to know it. Uh, this biography of other people. What? In what way it is overestimated? Well, because it maintains a focus on the individual. And even if you want to understand the individual, 
you really need to, you know, to extend your focus. So that's the idea. And mm -hmm. again, I'm not one of these French authors from the 60s of the last century who really wanted to kill the author uh, or, or because they really had in mind a structural analysis that would be able to, uh, well, to explain texts or the, pro the literary production in terms of structures. Uh, but I really think authors play a role. So they are, they are participants, they, they do play a role. I mean, Spinoza as an individual has a major role in the, in the, in the, in the, in the conception of, of Spinoza's philosophy. But if you want to understand this uh, or how the individual plays play the role, you really need to gather them. You really need several of them. So really the biography, what I, what, I, what I reject in the biography is the reduction of the focus on one single individual. But there is something very interesting in an intellectual biography is of course the merging of concepts, I would say, in everyday life. And this is very interesting because you can't, as I was saying, you can't quite draw a line between an event that occurred in, uh, in, in uh, a lifetime and a concept. It's not linear. So you can't say, for example, I don't know, uh, maybe Spinoza had um, a love affair that didn't went well. And so for that reason, women don't play any role in his philosophy. This is not really a, a, a proper explanation. So really you can't draw a line between a biographical fact and a conceptual feature of a philosophy. But what I really like is the idea that if you separate them, then you lose something. And the example, so, but the thing is, you can't have just one on the side and one at the other side. So if you take only one event and only one concept, it's impossible. You, it's, it's, it, it doesn't match. But now if you, if you take several things into account, so you consider like uh, uh, Spinoza's sisters, for example, uh, would not be literate. So he, was, he, he grew in a community where women uh, were even less valued as uh, compared to the Jewish communities of uh, Portugal and Spain, where they did have a major role because they would, they would teach their uh, children what uh, Judaism was. And they had lost their, this role in the Netherlands when they, when they flew uh, from the Inquisition, and they didn't play a major role. And then Spinoza meets also, uh, so uh, Clara von den Enden, who is the daughter of his Latin teacher and uh, several of, of uh, von den Enden's daughter uh, actually teach in his school. And they are good mathematicians, good uh, uh, musicians, uh, good um, uh, Latin teachers. So again, they are very literate. So Spinoza did uh, have um, an experience of women who are extremely intelligent and even Leibniz gets to uh, meet one of them in Paris and he says, wow, she's the marvel of all Paris because she's an excellent mathematician. So if you gather the pieces of the, the puzzle, then you, 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 you can see, you can have uh, an impression of what the general setting of uh, like the, the historical background was and the options that were available at that time. And then you can see that, well, feminism also was an option that Spinoza didn't choose. And around him, some people were actively involved into like the defense of, of women and uh, the necessity of an equal training, for example, when it comes to uh, to uh, science and uh, letters. So it's very interesting to reconstruct something that is more complex so that eventually you realize that the intellectual uh, background is, uh, contains more options uh, mm -hmm. than we usually think of. So that's really what I wanted to do. Okay, so it's not a biography as such, but it's the way um, 
how it is uh, how it is uh, to, uh, uh, written or, or, or told. Exactly. So the biography. And Um, Maxim, I have a, a question coming from a participant. So you described the development of philosophy as a conversation between curious people, between uh, or coming from different disciplines. How does uh, you how do you link the development of philosophy to the measure of freedom in the current uh, nation states? Ah, you interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Today, uh, well, today it's different because we are in an era of, of uh, separation between disciplines. So even how I feel about it is, is, is that scholars are more and more confined into very specific uh, areas. So you're not even a philosopher anymore. You're a historian of philosophy of a certain um, century and uh, of a certain uh, uh, country and little by little you get so specific that you are not uh, accepted uh, when you want to talk about somebody else, some, something else. So if I write a book on the, I don't know, philosophers of the 20th century or of philosophers or medieval philosophers or um, from Greece, uh, then it will be considered as something very bold, whereas I'm, I'm already a historian of philosophy. So it's my own discipline that I cannot travel through as we used to. So the, the, the real problem today is not really the nation state. It's really how you define, uh, I would say, the scientificity of our works. And I think what we have, the, one of the problems we have to face as intellectual historians is that we are uh, compelled to write lots of articles without having time to even read articles that, doesn't, that don't belong to our discipline. And I don't even talk about uh, philosophy in general and not being able to read history or to read uh, physics or to read medicine. But I'm even saying in, inside philosophy, we don't even have time to read books about uh, ancient Greek, or Greece or, um, or a contemporary philosophy. So that's one of the reasons why I had to quit uh, from my position uh, of, of professor in, in Brazil, because I really think it's important for me to read about uh, logics, uh, contemporary logics, and uh, yeah, whatever field I think is relevant, psychology, um, sociology and fields that are relevant to, to feed ourselves. So I, I think what you said about curiosity is absolutely fundamental. In fact, I would say what defines philosophy for these people in the, in the 17th century is more uh, a general curiosity towards nature that, that, that as opposed to supernatural, as opposed to uh, sacred texts, uh, and not a discipline, not the, the work of the concept or the idea that they have a specific tool that would be the concept or they have a specific object that would be nature. It's really about uh, curiosity. So that's what is philosophical between them. And that's the, that's the link between the anatomist and the mathematician mm -hmm. and so on. They all share this, this same curiosity. Um, another question, Maxime. Uh, what would you say to the newly published book by Amsterdam University philosopher Victor Karl, uh, entitled The Rules of uh, Spinoza, that suggests that Spinoza, in fact, lucidly designed a state, in quote, state religion in which to shrewdly enclose to the citizens? Yes, that's the, uh, the well. That that's the idea. The thing is, what I try to show is that Spinoza is far from being the only author who tries and promote a state that would be uh, respectful of the diversity of his citizens. So, quite on the contrary, Spinoza's position, if you compare to that of Kurbach or if you compare to Van den Enden, is rather moderate. So the, 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 what I find very interesting in the Netherlands in the 
17th century is the diversity of authors who are actually trying to think and to defend uh, this type of freedom uh, and, and of political um, uh, progress, you know, towards more and more uh, respect towards the citizens. So I think uh, in, in, in the Netherlands, it is important that you guys who have access to these texts that many a times are not translated into any other language, not even in English sometimes, uh, you have a wealth of, of authors from the 17th century that really have marvelous uh, theories, uh, political theories. And it's really a shame that the Courbach and uh, Van den Enden and many others, um, the De La Cour or, or others, uh, don't have um, enough um, you know, exposure uh, to uh, the public because they really are fantastic authors. Um, also, Descartes and Spinoza overlap only for the first 18 years of Spinoza's life. Uh, what was the role of Descartes in Spinoza's thinking, given that they were both in the Dutch Republic at the same time? Yeah, actually, they didn't uh, get to meet, of course, because Spinoza mm. was too young. But Spinoza and his friends consider themselves as Cartesian. And Cartesian... It, depending on the author, can mean very different things. Sometimes it just means that they, they refer uh, to a philosophy where physics would be based only on mechanics. So that is uh, movement and repose would be the main um, concepts. But uh, Cartesianism can also mean that you actually actively comment on Descartes works and that's where you meet Spinoza because Spinoza is firstly famous during his own time as a commentator of Descartes principles so he really teaches he's a teacher of Cartesian philosophy but literally like he comments on Spinoza's text oh no sorry on, on Descartes text but little by little he's also known as someone who is going too far in the commentary. Because of course, even though they don't have, um, you know, this ideal we have today, that when you comment on the author, you try to sort of, uh, as Colin Wood would say, you reenact his philosophy. You try to, to find what exactly was the, the act that was involved into this philosophy. Well, at that time, you really comment on freely on what you think is important or what you think is true in a text. So you're, you're quite free. But even so, Spinoza was considered as going too far and, and transforming Descartes' philosophy. And little by little, he would assume the position of someone who is rewriting his own thinking, starting from Descartes, but going into something else that he, and that's why, why it's important, that Spinoza himself wouldn't accept as being from Spinoza because he would consider this is from our group. So it's not, uh, that, that's the, the main um, innovation I would like to introduce in the story is like in the 20th century, you would tell the stories that, well, Spinoza started as a Cartesian and he ended as a, a Spinozist. Well, it's not quite like this. He started as a Cartesian reading Descartes and he ended up as the leader of a group where many authors would be considered as co-leaders. And uh, Ludwig Meyer, for example, is one of them. He's very important. He's very bold. He's a poet. He's a physicist. He's many things. And he's certainly not uh, someone Spinoza would look down to. Uh, quite on the contrary, he would look, look up to him. So Meyer is more famous. He's more uh, like, I don't know, he's an aristocrat. He's, he's obviously more popular than Spinoza among his own friends, you know, although Spinoza was very loved by some of his friends. So really the idea is that Spinoza remains a Cartesian throughout all his life, although his philosophy eventually becomes something very original. But to him, it belongs to a group and not to a, a single individual. 
Thank you, Maxime. I have one last short question. Um, short, I don't know, but uh, what are your next, uh, your future projects? Linked to Spinoza or not? Yeah, well, I have two main projects. One that is directly uh, uh, a follow-up uh, of, of this work. And uh, another one that is, that, that is uh, quite far from Spinoza. So the, the first is that I'm trying to retranslate uh, book after book uh, Spinoza's works into French. And so uh, in autumn, I will be publishing uh, one of his books in French. And so you will see what, what, which one of his works will, will come out first. But I have translated already uh, his correspondence. So I'm continuing this work of translation. And then uh, the, the second project I'm working on is, is an attempt to, to work the same way, that is to, uh, to address uh, collective thinking, but in Rome in the first century after Christ among uh, the Stoics. Stoics and also other uh, philosophers involved uh, in the circles of, uh, say, from Seneca to Epictetus or something like that. So the idea is to continue to study uh, groups of philosophers and to, to write uh, novels that would be both historical and philosophical. Merci. Thank, thank you, Van Yeah. Yeah, thank you for yeah, this debate conversation, very interesting. And I hope you will soon have the occasion to come back to, to Nayas or to do other research, Maxime. And uh, yeah, thank you for um, to um, to Scope of Five Hundred Twenty um, and to the um, yeah, to your edition. Um, and yeah, please come. But we'll come back soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miriam, for your questions. Uh, thank you, Doreen, uh, for this event. And it was a great pleasure. I hope to be back in Amsterdam soon because anyway, I have so many works and so many books to read and archives to explore and colleagues to to meet and exchange ideas and uh, i hope to see you soon <laughs>